Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our DMLL Research Week, uh, Social Justice, Language and Social Justice. Um, I would like to um, start by apologizing for the late changes in our program. Dr. Joan Ferreira, who was our key speaker, um, is not able to, to join us today. So instead, I will be talking a little bit about the relationship of language and human rights and therefore social justice. Um, for the ones that know me, my name is Paola Palma. I am a foreign language instructor at the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics, um, the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Um, I teach um, Spanish at the undergraduate uh, BA program in Spanish. Um, so let's begin. When we, when we, okay, so when we speak about um, social justice, uh, we are talking about human rights. And language has, as, as we have seen uh, in the presentations this week, language is part of, of the human rights. Um, while I was researching about this topic, I came across uh, with um, this book, um, language and social justice in practice. Um, and in particular, the article, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, this article discusses topics such as um, um, language, the relationship between language and law, law, uh, migration, um, my minority languages and language loss among other topics. So I, I thought this um, article and these topics were relevant to the presentations that you are about to listen to today. Um, so I decided to talk a little bit about it. So let's start by um, talking about what human rights are. So, Human rights, um, human rights are, are seen as need, uh, needed for humanity. Uh, these are things that we need in order to, to, live, um, to live well. And every human is, um, is supposed to be guaranteed these rights regardless of their origin or um, any di distinction of any, any kind. So the next question, is language a human right? Well, um, this author, Spolsky, he believes that language rights do derive from the principles established in human rights. For example, if we look at um, um, access to education, in um, access to education is one of the human rights. Now, access to education in one's language is a human right. Uh, well, it's, it's still a, a human right. Um, give me just one second. Uh, other examples of this is um, um, the right to have a fair trial that mean, uh, meaning um, to be able to um, be prosecuted in case or to have access to law in a language that you can understand, uh, to have medical attention and health uh, information provided in, in the language that you can understand, um, and language as part of um, one's identity. Um, language is also important because it's seen as a mean to know and preserve your own cultural heritage. And in some cases, the access to socioeconomical activity depends on language. And not everybody has the possibility to access to this 
in their own language. Um, the, the universal, sorry, uh, the universal declaration of human rights is required in order to correct linguistic imbalances. And um, sorry, I'm just I'm just um, using I I lost the note. Um, okay, so around the world, sorry about that. Um, around the world, there has been a general dissatisfaction on how political institutions and economic systems have impacted in a negative way language, uh, many language communities and in particular ethnic minorities and other groups that are relatively powerless. Um, there is a lack of explicit language policies enacted by governments or international organizations that value language as a resource um, for preservation of those communities. Also, the lack of language policies and the existing policies that fail to promote social justice have only created more inequalities. And um, an example of that is the restrictions of language use in education in, in the schools. Um, we can name many um, scholarly articles um, produced here in the Caribbean about the restriction of using Creole in, in school. Other cases are when um, um, some people are given preference or are being rejected for uh, employment depending on the language that they speak. Um, so motivated by that dissatisfaction and the human rights statement of um, that, well, that risk that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Um, the um, Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights was signed in 1996 at a conference hosted by um, this, um, um, uh, the Escarre International Center of Ethnic Minorities and Nations in Barcelona. Other organizations also attended this conference. Um, some of those were the UNESCO, a branch of the United Nations. And PEN International stands, uh, P-E-N stands for Poets and Sages and Novelists. That is an organization that works to promote um, and defend the freedom of expression around the world by writers. And they are working tirelessly on promoting the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights. Um, so now let's talk about language loss. Uh, some statistics estimate that the number of languages spoken in the world today is over 6,000. And despite that wide variety of languages spoken in the world, many individual languages and languages group, language groups are losing speakers at an alarming rate to the point that um, a huge number of these um, endangered languages are about to become extinct or have become extinct. Um, some researchers have even compared language in, their, in, in the Engagement and loss to the endangered uh, status of many plants and animals around the world. Um, and they believe that if governments or international organizations don't do anything about this, they, they don't start enacting legis legislation to preserve these languages, there would be a greater, greater loss. Um, now, what is the relation of language laws and the Universal Declaration of um, um, Language Rights? Um, to address the potential loss of many of those world languages, the Universal Declaration of Language Rights identifies a, a list of rights 
that um, that should be exercised. Um, those rights are, as you can see, the right to be recognized as a member of a language community, um, the right to use your own language in private and public, um, the, the right to interrelate and associate with other members of your language and the right to maintain and to develop that language. Um, by guaranteeing these rights, uh, there is a potential to prevent uh, or at least to slow the language laws within a community, as well as to solidify cultural identity. Uh, for example, a uh, feeling that it is safe to use your language in a public space can create positive attitudes towards the language rather than lead to shame and eventual abandonment of of using the language or uh, preserving it. Um, a similar situation have to do with migration. Uh, children who are born in countries older than their parents' homeland may not, have, may not have enough exposure to their parents' language. Also, negative, negative attitudes towards immigrants reflect the preservation of their mother language and their culture. Um, the former uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, um, Van Kimo, uh, believes that it is important to recognize migration as um, a key enable for equitative, inclusive, and sustainable social and economic development. Um, the author of this, this article that I was reading uh, believes that migrant, um, migrants especially, are especially disadvantaged by the lack of access to socioeconomic activity conducted in their own language. Although there are opportunities for some of these migrants, for example, translators, teachers, health professionals, their use of heritage language in order to learn to earn a living uh, depends on most part of the high level of proficiency in the majority language, not in their own language, but in the language spoken in the country that has that is hosting them. Um, in the meantime, however, it is too common for immigrants who are not bilingual to be unemployed or underemployed until which time they can function in the language of the wider society. Um, I believe that the presentation um, that we are um, hearing later today from Jewel Crawford, Crawford um, that she speaks about acculturation of Hispanic immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago will expand this idea. Um, migration, the Migration Policy Institute um, it's an independent or independent organization that provides um, extensive information on the condition of immigrants in different countries around the world. The mission of the, this institution's mission um, includes the idea that integration of immigrants is usually incomplete, which creates marginalization, and this marginalization leads leads the community to view, to view immigrants as consumers rather than potential resources for society. So it is believed that a well-conceived language and education policy that uphold language and human rights uh, have the potential to ease the often traumatic transition that refugees and immigrants face when they settle in the new society. Um, is this uh, um, a universal declaration of linguistic rights idealistic? Um, probably some researchers, um, some uh, people who work with human rights believe that it could be considered idealistic because the same as with the universal declaration of human rights is not a law. So it cannot be used in the court of law. 
but at least is creating a space and started uh, the discussion of what is needed uh, and what is especially needed to do in order to guarantee human rights as a whole and language rights as part of those human rights. So as you know, I am not an expert in the topic of human rights or language rights, but I believe that um, if this is, is an important space for us to, to start having this discussion. So I would like to invite anybody from the attendees who have some comments or if you want to engage on a quick discussion, we have a couple of minutes. Um, we can discuss a little bit this, this part. Okay, so I have a comment here from Joan. Sorry, Joan, I cannot see you. Joan Richards, um, who is attending from Jamaica. And she says, this is a particularly interesting view, the fact that we are still waiting for the Jamaican language to, made of, to be made official. So actually, I, I am not, um, I haven't followed the details of, of the status of the Jamaican Creole as, as an official language in, in Jamaica, but I know it has been an ongoing work for many years. It's, it's nothing new. And a lot of um, academics and officials from the government have been involved in this, um, in this process. Um, uh, Joan says, we made a petition to the government, but we didn't get enough signatures. Um, I believe that this also has to do with um, language attitudes. So we have, well, um, there are different articles, um, especially written about Jamaican Creole that, um, that show that still uh, people's attitudes towards the language or towards the status of a language uh, has a big influence in this type of decisions. Um, so Jake, I see Jake has a hand raised. Jake. Good morning. My question to you um, regarding the, the status of languages worldwide um, we see that the diversity of languages um, is being affected. Um, do you think that globalization has contributed to this? And furthermore, do you think that uh, um, there's a necessity for a global lingua franca to facilitate uh, um, trade and international business? Uh, um, as we talk about, you know, all the, you know, the all the diversity of having over six thousand languages in the world. Well, um, I believe that globalization has um, facilitated um, many changes in in the world, not only in respect to language, but um, um, science, technology. Um, the, the term of lingua franca uh, started, I guess, when globalization started after the Second World War, World, World War. Um, but I think different languages have given different status. And there were a lot of social issues that made English that lingua franca. The, the official language for communication, for trade, uh, for science and technology. But also there is, as I was saying, um, attitudes towards language influence a lot, the preservation of them. Um, I believe that governments or international organizations should be um, responsible for um, protecting, uh, for creating legislation that would protect 
uh, minority languages, for example, to guarantee um, information or to guarantee access to different services for speakers of those languages. But as I was mentioning before, I also believe that um, negative attitudes towards the language, uh, some um, racism or um, um, discrimination, depending on where the person is, is from, also influences the fact that the speakers themselves don't want to speak their own language and they don't want to pass on that language to, to their children. And it is there where the language starts dying. Um, not, on, not only the attitude, but also the fact that they don't see the use of that language, their own language, because they are in a society where they cannot access information, they cannot access education or health services in their own language. So they don't see the need to use it or to preserve it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so we have another comment in the chat from Petra Avila Leon. I hope I read it correctly. Um, she says, I wonder how under the current situation of pandemic restrictions, not only immigrants, but also local speakers of endangered languages are limited even more. Um, I do believe that the pandemic restrictions are just another of the many restrictions that many speakers face um, every day. And definitely the lockdown and the restrictions of movement, I believe somehow they have some influence in, in that. Okay, so um, I think my time is up. Um, oh, one, one last, last comment, uh, because Karim was saying from yesterday that he was going to prepare questions for today. So I'm going to read his and then I will introduce the next speaker. So Karim says, um, what do you say? What you say is interesting. What is quite alarming is that here in Trinidad and Tobago, there isn't any law that covers language in the sense of official or second, third, fourth acquisition, et cetera, of languages. Being that language is a right for all, then it should be found in our laws with clear precepts that guides education for all as means of education and thus provide representations, legal health, education, etc., of diverse societies, such as Venezuelans, Cubans, persons from the Dominican Republic, like that of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, yes, Karim, this is um, a great concern, especially because if you look at some of the government documents, they mention um, the um, implementation of a second language, of a foreign language. And if you have read about it, you will see that Spanish has been considered that second or that official um, foreign official language of Trinidad. However, um, when we talk about language policies, they depend a lot on political agendas. And it is, as you mentioned, it is responsibility of the government to, to promote or to make it official or give it status to, to those languages. Um, I believe that in Trinidad and Tobago, the conversation has started. I believe that there is a lot of work to do. And also, I believe that the university as the, the institution that produces knowledge it should be responsible for doing research and write those articles that will support that decision from the government that will either support it or push for that decision. Thank you very much, Karim, for your comment. Um, and thanks everybody for your comments and your questions. Now I am going to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, he's Jake Victor Salon. Uh, Jake is- Paula? Hello, sorry to butt in, Paula. 
Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So I will introduce ben, uh, Dr. Benjamin Brockway, and he's going to continue from that. Thank you so much, Paula. And uh, I want to say thank you to Paula for her presentation about uh, language rights, uh, which is, I think, a really crucial aspect of the general topic of our research week, which is language and social justice. And I think uh, the thing, the topics that Paula was talking about really sets up uh, not only the presentations that we have today, but also for tomorrow. I just wanted to quickly, before we pass on to Jake, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that came out of the conversation. Um, one thing was the question of uh, the Jamaican language and Jamaican language policy. Um, and I want to advertise to everyone that we're really, really excited that tomorrow, uh, our final speaker, the culmination of our research week um, is going to be Professor Hubert Devonish, who has been uh, tireless and um, a heroic presence in the uh, language rights movement in the Caribbean for several decades. Um, who was uh, foundational in helping to set up the Jamaican language unit at the University of the West Indies um, in Mona. Um, and, and also uh, what he's talking about, I think is gonna relate to something that um, Paula mentioned. Paula talked about language endangerment. And I think one of the big factors in language endangerment historically was uh, the colonization of the world by uh, European powers. Uh, that resulted in uh, the genocide and destruction of uh, people and their cultures and their languages across the world. Uh, and Professor Devonish's talk is, is going to be uh, looking at the reparations movement and how that can be connected to language rights. Um, and one other thing that, that connects what Paolo was talking about to some of our presentations tomorrow was uh, sign languages. Sign languages like other marginalized languages like Creole languages and indigenous languages. Um, also, uh, the, the people who use those languages are subject to uh, discrimination and marginalization. Um, and in tomorrow's sessions, we'll be having a number of presentations talking about uh, those issues. And also the issue that Jake just raised of uh, was it Jake? Someone just raised of the pandemic and someone else raised in the chat. Uh, so um, I know that we have two presentations tomorrow looking at the way in which the pandemic and the switch to doing things like this on Zoom online um, has affected the language rights of, um, of deaf children, especially so tomorrow. Uh, so lots of things to look forward to tomorrow, but Lots of things to look forward to right now because we have our next presenter. I'm very excited uh, that uh, Jake Saloom is going to be presenting, partly because he's talking about such an important topic and partly because he's an undergraduate linguistics student here at the University of the West Indies. And it's fantastic to see, uh, you can see already the next generation of uh, language activists, uh, uh, language researchers here in the department. And uh, Jake's topic also connects with what Paola was talking about. Paola was talking about uh, language endangerment. And one of the uh, global responses to language endangerment has been revitalization, trying to um, uh, address the uh, disappearance, the marginalization, the endangerment of languages via trying to reverse that, trying to revitalize. So um, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Jake Saloum, who will be talking about the revitalization of an endangered language in Trinidad, Trinidad Patois, um, through its implementation in the education system in Trinidad. So over to you, Jake. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brathwaite. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I begin, I just want to give my due acknowledgments to all the distinguished guests we have here. Um, including Dr. Brathwaite, Dr. Nicole Roberts, um, Romulo Guedes Fernandez, uh, um, Ms. Palma Rojas. Um, and I just want to say it's a, it's a complete honor to be here this morning. And what I'm discussing this morning is, as um, Dr. Brathwaite said, um, very relevant to what uh, um, Ms. Palma Rojas just discussed. And that is because you know it's addressing one of the 
endangered languages in Trinidad, which is Trinidad Papua. Now, the past two semesters, I, um, I engaged in a case study of revitalization efforts of Patwa, specifically in Talparo with Talparo RC School. Um, and here are the research questions that I want to look at this morning. So first and foremost, I want to look at what is the current sociolinguistic situation of Trinidad? What is the status of Patwa within that sociolinguistic situation? Then I'm going to give you my, my reasons and my arguments for the importance of preserving Patwa. Then after that, I will tie that into what has Talparo RC School been doing? For the past few months, I've been spending a lot of time with Talparo RC School, and we're going to look at what revitalization methods they have engaged in and how is that applicable, applicable to other primary schools in Trinidad. And then lastly, I think an important question is, um, because I'm looking specifically at education, but my question at, at the end of this is, is education enough to revitalize a language? Um, now, first and foremost, I just want to say that the sociolinguistic situation of Trinidad is complex. And what I, you know, this research week, the whole theme of this research week is language and social justice in the Caribbean. And I would just like to say that social justice has been basically non-existent in the Caribbean, if we look at it from a language's point of view. Um, and why is that? I think that this island is built on language death. Um, the Amerindian languages of pre-Columbian times have disappeared, and nowadays our heritage languages like Patwa are increasingly on the brink of language death. Um, I think what is interesting also about Trinidad is how rapidly the sociolinguistic situation evolves, um, because um, what we're going to learn today is that Patwa was the lingua franca of Trinidad throughout the 19th century before it became displaced by English. And even though we have uh, on paper that English, standard English, um, Trinidadian and Tobagonian standard English is the official, the only national language of Trinidad, um, it does not exist in isolation. And I think all of us as Trinidadians know how much our variation of English has been influenced by the uh, the numerous languages that it coexists with in this little island of ours. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, back in the 19th century, there were over 30 languages spoken in Trinidad. Um, as I said, the, um, the unifying language amongst the majority of the population was um, Patwa. And um, and also, if you look at the demographics at the time in the 19th century, the, um, the largest majority of Trinidad's population was French Creoles. Um, nowadays, 12 heritage languages are still spoken. I listed a few here. Um, so besides Patwa, we also have Bhojpuri, which is also um, seeing some revitalization efforts. Um, there's also Yoruba which is still used in religious practices. Um, there's Cantonese, there's Portuguese, there's um, Arabic that is still used to an extent within the Syrian Lebanese community. And there's of course Trinidad and Tobago sign language, which they're going to have a lot of presentations on tomorrow. Um, talk going back to how rapidly this sociolinguistic situation evolves, because as I said, in the 19th century, um, you know, Patwa was the dominant language, that, but then, you know, in the 20th century, that soon became, um, you know, displaced by English. Um, we now have reached the 21st century where the growing number of Spanish speakers in Trinidad is increasing. Now, I'd just like to also acknowledge that Spanish has always been a language that is spoken in Trinidad. Our connections with Venezuela go 
you know, much further back before the economic crisis there. Um, but as we all know that there's, there's um, a large amount, there's a large number of um, Venezuelans living amongst us now, and they've brought with them their language. Um, but what I think is interesting talking about this evolution is that um, I, I question that is Spanish still going to be the language spoken by second generation and third gen generation of these Venezuelan migrants? Because as I said, if we look at the history of Trinidad, we see that the heritage languages of groups who've migrated here have not survived um, because of the dominance, the, the, um, the societal dominance of English. And I just like to say that history has shown us that Trinidad has not been tolerant to multilingualism. In fact, Trinbegonian linguist Mervyn C. Allen has described the insular Caribbean archipelago as a linguistic graveyard. And as, I, as we would look at today, um, we're looking specifically at how did Patwa add to this linguistic graveyard that Allen has described. Now, just a brief history for those who might not be familiar with this is that French Creole was brought to Trinidad after the Cedula de Poblacion in 1783, which saw um, the large uh, arrivals of French Creoles and their enslaved Africans who all spoke either French or who spoke the Creole language. Um, a very important quote that I came across is that French Creole that Patwa crossed every ethno-linguistic, social, and geographic boundary, facilitating communication among speakers of over 20 languages in mid 19th century Trinidad. Now, with all of this in mind, you must be wondering then what happened now um, after Trinidad became a British colony around 1815. Um, I, I, I started this off by saying that how the sociolinguistic situation is complex. And one of my favorite quotes that I've read like this is that the British encountered Tr Trinidad and Ireland that uh, had Spanish laws, but was predominantly French Creole and French speakers. Um, but, you know, on paper, it was a British colony. So Trinidad has always been a wild place um, where we see different um, intersectionalities of languages and identities all coming together. Um, now, what this made me think is, we're well, going back, before I go to that, the, um, and maybe I need to explain the anglicization policy a bit. Um, basically, it was targeted at um, erasing the French and the French Creole identity in Trinidad um, to the greatest degree possible, because when Trinidad became a British colony, there became this urgency by the colonial government to sort of um, assert that, uh, that uh, notion of being of being British and, and you know, insert that notion of imperialism. And they thought, and you know, it's I don't um I do I understand why this was the train of thought of the time, because if you just captured a colony, then obviously, you know, ideally you would want your language being spoken there. But uh, the train of thought was is that we can't have a British colony that is uh, that does not that that does not speak english and going back to uh, charles william warner he declared um at a certain at in 1845 english rights and privileges should only be given to those who would take the trouble to learn english and to bring their children up in an english way now this uh, um influenced him to implementing the anglicization policy which basically um, prohibited French and French Creole from being spoken in schools. And I just think what's really interesting is that if you look at all of the first um, educational institutions in Trinidad, such as St. Mary's College, St. Joseph Convent, um, these, these schools did not originally teach in English. They actually originally taught in French. So there was a distinct Frenchness of Trinidad um, 
at the, at the time, you know, French being the language of education and then French Creole being the language that brought everybody together um, outside of that in day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day commerce. Um, but as I said, the whole, the whole notion of this Anglicization policy is that by um, cheat, by prohibiting the use, this, this, the use of Patois and of French at schools, um, we can basically, um, you know, drive out that French influence of Trinidad and drive out that Creole influence. And what this has made me think of is that education is a powerful weapon and education can be used in, in sort of a war between languages and it can be used in two ways. It can be used to either um, suppress a language, destroy a language, and we've seen we've seen this happen in um, you know in the Americas because even if we look at we're talking about the Caribbean this week, but even I think even if we look at Central America and South America, we see that how indigenous languages have been suppressed there um, in favor of Spanish, um, but you know all of this is attainable through education. Um, because you know, if you if you look at if you think about what is the language of instruction, it's and what um, what educational policies favor as the language of instruction. If they favor a certain language, that sort that gives that language the prestige and the dominance within the society. That causes that language to um, to be the one that. Um, students prefer to learn at the, ex at, the ex at the expense of their heritage languages. Um, but I think that education can also be simultaneously used as a tool of empowerment and a tool to liberate people from these notions of what is, uh, what is um, good language versus what is bad language, what is proper language, as we like to say in Trinidad, what is proper English versus what is broken English or broken French. Um, and I think um, bringing this back to the Caribbean, there's, um, there's an, you know, an interesting study as well in Haiti where they sort of have this struggle between French being the language of instruction at schools, even though that the majority of the, the majority of the population is Haitian Creole speaking. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion around how that hinders students' performance. Um, but I think, I think it's really interesting to view education in these two lights. And um, what this has caused today by English becoming the language, the dominant language and the prestigious language through the education system in Trinidad, this has resulted in Patois becoming um, an endangered language, the language that is eminent. And um, not only I would like to highlight that, the, that it's predominantly still spoken by an aging population, it's predominantly still spoken by elderly speakers, it's important to acknowledge that what, uh, what also influences the language to die is that nobody is speaking Patois as a first language. No, ch no children anymore are being born into Patois speaking households in comparison to if we would look back to our grandparents and our great grandparents' time. Um, I'm sure that everybody here can go to their great their grandparents or great grandparents and ask was Patois spoken around the house or did they hear Patois being spoken? This has completely changed in the, um, in the 21st, 21st century Trinidad. And nowadays we only see Patois spoken in remote villages, the most popular being Paramin. But these, um, these uh, communities were able to preserve that Patois heritage um, due to their geographical isolation. But I think it's important to highlight that these communities um, preserve these languages at, at, at an expense um, of, you know, being victims of linguistic discrimination. And if you, um, if you speak to, if you look at interviews of those people, of those, um, those elderly people in, pa in Paramin who still speak Patois, they would tell you that, oh, we were told it was pig language and that it was broken French and that, you know, it's so, it's, it, what this, what, what, tying this back to attitudes towards languages, what this tells us is that attitudes towards languages in the country can also influence how speakers of that language 
value their language and that influences whether they decide to pass it down to their children or not. And as in the case of Paramit, and pardon, as in the case of Patwa, um, you know, they have chosen not to pass down the language, all of this contributing to its endangered status right now. Um, there's different estimates. Now, the problem in Trinidad as well, we're talking about the lack of language policy. There's also a lack of, there's a lack of general language policy. There's only, as of now, there's only a drafted language policy for the Ministry of Education, but there's, there's been nothing officially implemented. But um, there's also a lack of census in terms of what are the, what are the different um the number of speakers with for each language in trinidad and um with part where part was concerned i found different estimates i um one said 3800 speakers remain one said 1000 to 2000 speakers remain which is but you know the whole point of this is to show that the situation is bleak because as i said if this elderly when this aging demographic of patwa speakers dies and then there's no children who are speaking Patois as a first language, then the language officially becomes extinct. Now, you're probably asking, why am I so interested in this? Why save Patois? What is the what is so important about it? I actually, when I when I've been pursuing this project within um within this past two semesters, I've received some of the most ridiculous feedback when I tell like family members and friends that. Recently, somebody told me, well, if Patwa dies, what's so wrong with that? Latin died. And I, you know, I get such um, crazy feedback, but I'm, that's why I thought it was important to talk about why I think we need to save Patwa. And the first point I want to raise is that there's a deep sense of the Trinidadian identity rooted in Patwa. We use Patwa words on a daily basis and we don't even realize it. Words like Mako and FET, which we know are the two national pastimes of Trinidadians. Those are Patwa words. Um, we use Patwa to describe the world around us. Um, for example, um, you know, from the pomerac and the pomsite you eat to the piece of zavoka you put next to your pelau and, you know, the shadow ben you're using to season your food. All of these things are very Trinidadian and it's patwa words that describe these, these physical things that we encounter every day. Um, patwa is in our flora, our fauna, our plants. I'm sure, um, you know, you might know green fig or you might know mango doo-doo, mango ver, mango long. All of this is just um, examples of patwa because notice that they put the adjective after the noun um, as compared to in English where you'd say long mango, green mango, sweet mango, no in patwa, it's mango doo-doo, mango ver. Um, our folklore, mama dlo, papa bois, um, our carnival, what culturally unites us every year, despite our ethnic backgrounds and our religion, our juve, cambole, dimanche, gra, jab, jab, dam, lorraine, all of these are patwa words. I would also like to say that the influence of patwa is evident in the lexicon and syntax of Trinidadian, Trinidadian English Creole as a linguist, um, as a linguist would tell you. Um, and uh, I would... Um, it was, I did, I did two French Creole courses um, this semester and last semester. And I'll just tell you, it was an extremely eye-opening experience because I saw how things that were, that are in French Creole, like literally translate into Patois, such as like putting a, a verb marker in front of the verb, like in Patois, you'd say moi ka manger, and the ka, you know, gives that sense of something being habitual. Um, and in Trinidad English Creole, um, you would say, I does eat. You might mark the past tense, you would mark the past tense in part, but with te, mwe te maje, and in Trinidad English Creole, we'd say, I did eat. Um, so this is, it was an extremely eye-opening experience to study the language. And then lastly, I just want to point out that our Creole identity connects us to the wider Caribbean region because this French Creole language is spoken by 13 million people in the Caribbean in other islands like 
Grenada, St. Lucia, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Dominica, um, the majority of that population being in Haiti, but it connects us to the rest of the Caribbean. And I think it fosters a sense of regionalism, which is desperately needed at this time of the pandemic. We all need to work together as a region to sort of get our way out of this. And then also look at what happened in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and how we all had to come together as CARICOM um, to aid in this natural disaster. I think that lang the languages that connect us, like our Creoles, aids in the sense of regionalism. Um, so what, now it's time for the juice of the matters. What has Talparo RC School done to revive Patwa? So I spent the, um, the past few months um, observing Talparo RC School and, you know, the teacher who's been sort of the, um, you know, the push factor of all of these initiatives is Michelle Mora Fotheringham, who I've developed a very close friendship with. Um, right now, because of the pandemic and because of online learning, they're conducting their classes via um, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And they have actually now, from this term, started doing it with all age, all um, grade levels in the school, from the infants to the standard, um, to the standard fives. Um, classes typically last 25 minutes. Um, she, you know, uh, Miss Mora Fotheringham believes that it's important to keep the classes short because when you're, when you're working with children and young students, you know, the attention spans are different from adults. And so it's more engaging um, to have them for shorter times. Um, in the school itself, what is really cool is that they have a Creole bulletin board. And this bullet, this board, this notice board highlights Creole culture. It has up a poster that, um, that uh, you know, they did of the Patwa alphabet. It has vocabulary. It has historical and cultural fun facts. And the school every year participates in Patwa Mass, and they put on a Patwa concert with all the events being in Patwa. It's called Say Yon Bagai Patwa Concert. So all of this is to say that they, you know, they place an importance in engaging the students in the language, outside, not just in the classroom, but also outside the classroom, which I think is super important. Um, what they did also that's pretty cool is because obviously if you're learning a language, you want to practice it. And so they started pen pals with par, um, students at Paramin RC School, where, which is one of the, the other schools in Trinidad that is attempting to revitalize Patua through education so that, you know, you learn it in the class, but then you could also like message and talk to somebody who also speaks the language in Trinidad. Um, right now, Miss Mora Fotheringham is, uh, you know, drafting a syllabus to use, and she's basing it on the Spanish primary school curriculum. Um, so the structure that that Spanish primary school curriculum has, she's following it in terms of how to, in what steps to teach the language. Um, the school is also currently working on a workbook, an available at school workbook, and sort of textbook to help the students in these classes. And then also they have past students of the school who want to continue to learn the language. And so they're starting a Patwa club um, for these secondary school students so that they can still be, um, you know, active learners in the language. Now, I also visited four other primary schools where these classes are not being taught to sort of see what their attitudes towards um, Patwa are. And it was, I got, I got, you know, responses from 165 students from Belmont Boys RC School, St. Andrews Private School, Patna River State Government School, and Maria Regina Grade School. And I want, I think this, this um, pie chart right here shows something really amazing um, because in most Trinidadians, Trinidadian schools, you don't start learning a second language until form one. But if you look here, about 96% of the 165 respondents from these primary schools said that they want to learn a second language. So this is really, I think this is really important because it shows that children value learning a second language. Um, so, sorry to interrupt, Jake, but um, mm -hmm. uh, we're going a little over time. So if you've got a minute left and then we'll have a few questions. Okay, so my other pie charts just talk about, um, as you would see, the um, percentages of them that want to learn Patwa is also significant. 83.6% of them think it would be useful. 72.7% of them would think it would be 
um, it would would like to learn how to speak it, and then seventy one point five percent of them would think um, one, you know, something like what's being taught at Tal Paro and being taught at Paramin at their own school. Now, because um, I've run out of time, my apologies. I would just like to end on my final thoughts. Now, um, this, you know, revitalization is a very complex process. Um, I've specifically looked at it in the sense of um, education and, you know, Palparo recognizes that it's a complex process and that it's not, you know, just teaching it that the school is not going to be enough. So the the um, Talparo Community Upliftment Upliftment Group is drafting proposals to incorporate Tal um, Papua into the daily lives of the community through different ways that you would see listed here. But um, you know, depending on how this goes, I mean, it's my goal to see Papua fully revitalized in my lifetime. Um, depending on how this goes, I just, for my final thoughts, I just want to say that do not let history repeat itself. And what I mean by this is that we, we as language and linguistic students need to sort of sensitize the public to the fact that, um, you know, all languages are valuable. Um, there's no such, Creoles are not broken English, they're not broken French. Um, because if we allow this mentality and this train of thought to continue to perpetuate, we're just, it's just history repeating itself and it's just going to be, it's just going back to the 1800s where kids who spoke Patwa weren't, you know, we're told you know, they're not allowed to speak Patwa in the classroom. If we tell students in our secondary schools, don't speak English Creole, it's bad English, it's improper English. That's, it's basically the same thing as going back to the 1800s with what Papua speaking um, students were told. If we discriminate people as soon as they walk into the workplace because they're speaking English Creole and we're like, oh, well, they can't speak proper, so we shouldn't employ them. Because this is a real thing. This discrimination really happens. Again, it's just history repeating itself. So just to conclude, I think that our job as language and linguistic students is to um, sh slowly but surely um, dismantle these, uh, um, these perceptions of language that have been passed down since colonialism. And I think by doing that, we're going to truly foster a pride in our Trinidadian, in our Caribbean um, identity. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jake, so much. Uh, that's a, a, a wonderful presentation, very inspiring, very a, a great deal to think about. Um, uh, I'm going to read a few comments. Uh, I saw earlier on that um, Dr. Nicole Roberts was very much uh, in agreement with you about the uh, two national pastimes of fetting and macoing, her yeah. favorite pastimes too, pre-COVID. Um, uh, we have a comment from Fahima Ali who says, your presentation was amazing and I absolutely enjoyed it. Your passion for this shines through a lot and I would love to see you continue your work. Um, I see Dr. Roberts just sent a question. Yes, um, so I'll, I'll read out the question so everyone, everyone gets it. Um, among the persons you mentioned, would you say that a large number of young persons also see no relevance to the survival of Patwa? By young, I mean among your uni colleagues. Um, I would, well, I could only, I mean, I have to do more research into that, but I um, for now, what I would say is that, you know, based on um, my peers and people my age who I've talked to, a lot of them actually have a yearning to connect to this language because they know that their grandparents and um, great grandparents spoke it. And they're like, oh, I just, I wish that I was just not, I was effectively bilingual. I wish that I could have just switched between English and Patwa when I wanted to. And I did an interview with Dr. Renee Figuera about this and she said that um, kids are going to feel a lot of incentive to learn the language if they can trace it back to a familial bond, whether that be that, it, or a communal bond, so if there's people in the community who speak it or if they had family members who, living or deceased who spoke it. Um, so I think that um, I think that there I think that there is hope. I think that a lot of young people are, are, are sort of um, are sort of sad that the language died because you know they see it as something cool. Um, but we could own. I think we could only um, sort of. Um, I think we could we could raise that 
that uh, that change that notion of it being useless if through um through technology through social media and also through um collaborations with different personal interested one that i did mention that i didn't get to speak about um in the presentation was that um soca artists could start using patwa more in their songs which is not far-fetched at all because you know if you do research you'd find out that calypso, all calypso was originally in patwa so i think that there is um i think that there is a hope um, f that I do have hope that you know there are young, a lot of young people out there who want to connect with this language. Okay, wonderful. Um, I want to um, just give a shout out also to Dr. Sandra Evans, who I'm seeing um, in the Zoom, and I think uh, Jake, as you were talking about um, the enthusiasm maybe amongst your peers, I think uh, Dr. Evans uh, uh, over the last several years, who has been teaching uh, French Creole mm -hmm. through UE. Has been a big part in she engendering has. awareness has. and knowledge and enthusiasm. Um, I think we have we've been a bit a bit of a victim of your success, Jake. Uh, your your presentation was so great that you've got lots and lots of questions and we've got no time to answer them. So I suggest what we do is um, we could continue the discussion about your presentation in the chat. Okay. And meanwhile, um, I will hand over to Paula because I'm aware that uh, we're a little behind schedule and she can introduce our next speaker. So okay, thanks thank again. Thank you so Jake. much for having me. It's been an honor. Okay, thank you very much, Ben and Jake, for your presentation. It was very interesting, and I saw that it um, triggered um, the interest of all our attendees. Um, now, as um, Dr. Bradway just mentioned, I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Her name is Jewel. Uh, Jewel is also a third-year student in the, she's majoring in Spanish and doing a minor in Brazilian studies. Um, Jewel believes that um, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, she should use her area of study to assist those who she can. She would, she would like to raise awareness about some of the issues which these Hispanic immigrants have encountered so that persons, local persons, we have a clearer idea of their living conditions and hopefully be motivated to reach out and support. Um, Jewel is going to speak about acculturation experiences, Hispanic immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago, and focusing on the importance of speaking the English language, uh, how uh, speaking English language would um, facilitate their stay in Trinidad. So welcome, Jewel. Good morning. Just a second, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so as we stated, the topic that I'll be presenting on is acculturation experiences of Spanish immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll be focusing on the importance of the English language to their stay in Trinidad. Before I start, I would like to give some. Okay. I would like to give some background information as to why I choose this topic. So as I began to recognize, so with the increase of in the Spanish immigrants and the number of Spanish immigrants that came to Trinidad and Tobago, I began to become interested in their experiences here, knowing that they would have been presented with a language barrier. So I was curious as to how the, how Trinidad and Tobago, how businesses and persons in general were trying to help and assist these, trying to help and assist them. So I'm going to give a, a little definition of acculturation. So it, it basically defines or it refers to the process whereby one group comes into continuous contact with another group and through these, these continuous interactions, they begin to incorporate different aspects of their culture into their own lives. For example, some aspects may be language, food, ways of dressing. So just to give a bit of a description of the participants in the study, five Spanish immigrants were interviewed, four of them 
of Venezuela and one of them is a Cuban. Of the participants, three of them are female, which were three Venezuelans, three female Venezuelans, and two are male, one male Cuban, and a Venezuelan. All of them worked with the exception of one. She preferred to use her time to take care of her children, her grandchildren. And they lived in Trinidad for approximately five months to 21 years with one of them. One of them has lived in Trinidad for 21 years and is currently living in Tobago and has been living there for approximately two years. My research questions. My research questions are, to what extent is language related to the acculturation experiences lived by Spanish-speaking immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago? And how does language influence interactions between Spanish-speaking immigrants and locals in Trinidad and Tobago? I'm going to give some more background information as from existing literature. So these were based on numerous studies that examine the experiences of immigrants, different immigrants in different countries. So one of the points that I found was that the perceived attitude, the attitude of the, the members of the host country was very important. And it says, I say perceived, the studies said perceived because it did not necessarily have to be true about the locals did not necessarily have to think this way about the immigrants who were not necessarily thinking this way. However, the way in which the immigrants thought that the locals thought about them is what impacted their ability to become acculturated or the, ex the types of experiences they had. Also, another study showed that cultural roles there were various cultural roles that were attributed to men and women, and this impacted their experiences. So for example, the woman in this study, the woman in this study were less likely to interact with locals because of because it was not culturally accepted, while the men would have had more experience going out to work and interacting with the locals. Also, in various countries. In various countries, despite they all they all recognize the importance of they all recognize the importance of language that it had various benefits to being able to speak the language of the host country. Additionally, although that although it had a lot of benefits, not all all of the all of the immigrants did not necessarily accept or see it as absolutely necessary and this would have been dependent on their day-to-day -day activities or the persons that they interacted with so for example some one of the studies researched a group that was more so communal in nature so they basically interacted among themselves in that they did work when they worked they only they only communicated with each other as well as their other social gathering, gatherings were limited to each other. So this group, although they did recognize that it would have benefits to be able to speak the language, for example, there would be greater job opportunities, the ability to communicate with the locals. They didn't necessarily see it as that important. Also, some immigrants, they experience discrimination for not being able to speak the language of the host country. So for example, they would have been called by derogatory names, but after constantly hearing these names, they, they would have learned them only to find out that it, it did not have a, a good meaning to it. Also, some of the immigrants, there were immigrants that were unable to learn the language of the host country and this caused them to feel they, they were unable to fit in to some extent and they had the desire to return home. So these here I'm going to share some of the things that I found based on my research based on my interviews with the Spanish immigrants and try to compare them to what was found in the existing literature. So all of the all of the in, all of, of the interviewees, three of them were able to speak English and Spanish fluently. 
So, sorry, two of them were able to speak English and English and Spanish fluently, while the other three were only able to speak Spanish. And even though they were unable to speak English, they were able to carry out their basic tasks. tasks. For example, go to the groceries, to buy food. They were able to go to work to find a job. And they all, similar to these, these studies that were found, they all recognized that English had many benefits, as was stated before, that it would have opened up more opportunities for them to possibly, there was a higher chance of them being able to get a better job with a higher paying salary. And they all, they all recognized the importance of it to communication. And as well as another point is that English, all of them had the desire to learn English. However, even though they wanted to do this, it was hindered by different things. For example, some of the immigrants due to their, their working schedules, they did not have time to they did not have time to set aside to learn the language. One thing that I'd like to point out as well is that even though English is very important it, in living it as, as immigrants living in Trinidad and Tobago, it is important to be able to speak English. It does not necessarily guarantee that they were going to get better job opportunities. So I have two examples of statements that were made. The first one, one that was only fluent in Spanish, he said, I do not believe that the ability to speak English will allow me to obtain a better job because of the increase in the number of Spanish immigrants. So he would have been referring particularly to the increase in the number of Venezuelan immigrants that were coming into Trinidad at that time. And so he he felt that yes, it, yes, it is important to learn English, but it did not give him hope that if I learn English, I am not going to be able to get a better job. And his current job, oh, at the point of the interview, he does small errands for his boss. This other uh, comment was made by one of the interviewees who were fluent in both Spanish and English. And she said, currently there is not any better job opportunities. So she was able to identify various, various jobs that she could have gotten or is or are available to persons who speak to or more languages. So for example, she gave the example of a interpreter translator and all these things, but she she still works in a closed store and she has been living in Trinidad for 19 years and has been working in this closed store for the past eight years. To continue, most of the all of the all of the interviews, with the exception of the Cuban, had good experiences. They enjoyed their stay in Trinidad and this was so to give two examples of what they said one of them said my experience here was generally good as i had the ability to obtain a job and provide for my family so this was regarded as a good experience and she enjoyed this ability and then however this statement which was made by the cuban the cuban interviewee he said i did not have any good experiences in trinidad trinidad is only a country of transit so even though he was able to get a job and to earn, earn money to provide for his family he still did not regard this as a a, a good experience as when asked if he had any he said no and this, however, the statement here made by that Trinidad is only a country of transit. This was a statement that was basically made by three of the participants who, who only spoke, who only had the ability to speak English. They only had the ability to speak Spanish. They all only saw Trinidad as a, a place that they wanted to stay temporarily and they wanted to return to their home country as soon as, soon as things return to normal. Also, in contrary to the, those that had the ability to speak both Spanish and English, they had the desire to remain in Trinidad. Another factor, so one important thing that I saw that was that the attitude of the locals was something that was more 
important in comparison to language. Although I stated before language, the ability to speak English was important to build and to form relationships. All, all of the interviewees, all of the Spanish immigrants stated that the attitude was more important as and this was a comment made, so I rather to make friends with persons who are kind, but I understand that they are persons who are kind or mean in both Trinidad and my home country. So to give an example, although the, the extent, the amount of Trinidadian friends would have been limited, they were still able to form a particular, they were still able to form relationships with them. So for example, one of them described her Trinidadian landlord as as family because she saw him as a kind person who always tried to assist her when she was in need and this was despite of the language barrier that existed between them. Sorry. Another point is that these Spanish immigrants prefer to live with or around Spanish immigrants, but two of them. And one of them, which would have been a Cuban, who only had the ability to speak Spanish, they basically said that it does, did not matter why, it did not matter whether or not they lived with Trinidadians or Spanish immigrants because they would not have any time in general to interact with them. However, the other two Spanish immigrants were those that could have only, only had the ability to speak Spanish and they said that they they would prefer to live with these Spanish immigrants to, to aid communication as it would have been easier to communicate with them. And then also another, another point is that they, some of the immigrants, they experience discrimination or they, they were made fun of when they were unable to speak the English language. So these are two things that I got from the interviews. One of them said, customers make fun of me when I am unable to understand them. And this was a comment that was made by the, by the Cuban immigrant in that if a customer asked for something, they would have shown like, they would have been confused or made comments off of him as to like, how can you not understand something so simple? Or how, how can you be working here and you're unable to understand this? And then another statement which was made, I am I am made fun of when I cannot pronounce an English word and all this participant works as a bartender and although she has the desire to learn English as well as would have been the case for the, those that could not, they, this was something that she did not like about, this was an, a bad experience that she had that she did not like about her stay in Trinidad. And this point, culture did not hinder the ability of the Spanish immigrants to learn the language. This point is related to a study that was done that I found in the existing literature where the culture was, where culture, because of culture, particular traits or but a particular behavior was expected from either men or women. So before, because the women in this were not, because it was not very acceptable or really acceptable for the women to interact with the locals, they, their ability to learn the, the language was hindered a bit. However, that was not the case with the Venezuelan, Venezuelan or Cuban immigrants. So to conclude, I would like to conclude by saying, although languages have great importance, there are also other factors that impact their culturation experiences of the immigrants. So which would have been, for example, the attitude, the attitude of the locals, as well as job opportunities. Also, the Spanish immigrants, as was stated, all of them were able to carry out their daily tasks, go to the grocery or Go shopping in general, despite of the barriers that existed. And then lastly, language competency, the ability to, the, the competency in the English language did not guarantee better job opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jewel, for your presentation. Um, I believe it was um, very interesting and very timely 
uh, due to the circumstances that many of these immigrants are living in Trinidad and Tobago. And as, as we mentioned before, it's an ongoing discussion. So um, we start now our um, session for questions and answers. Um, well, we, we already have some questions, so I would like to read them to you, Jewel. Um, this question is from Dr. Nicole Roberts. Um, she says, thank you, Jewel, great project and presentation. Um, can you briefly comment on the levels of education of the immigrants that you interviewed? Okay, while, while interviewing them, I didn't necessarily ask them about this. So, but one of them, the, one of them that had the ability to speak English, English fluently, she said that she learned that in university. So I can't say whether or not she completed the degree, not saying that she would not have, I just don't have that evidence. Um, so she would have had some university, some level of university studies. And then one of the immigrants who was the other one that had the ability to speak but sorry if you all are hearing background noise. One of the immigrants that had, the other immigrant that had the ability to speak English fluently, he is a, he teaches English, he teaches English in a school. I don't know the name of the school, but yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you. Um, next um, question. Oh, before that, I want to comment something on, on that fact. You say that um, your project showed that um, a proficiency in the language does not necessarily guarantee obtaining a better job. So what aspects do you think are important when we talk about acculturation? What do you believe are the main or the most important aspects that we need to consider when we talk about acculturation of immigrants in the new society. Okay. Well, although, although language was not necessarily the main factor that determined the ability to stay, to become acculturated into this society, I still think that it has a lot, it had a lot, it is still of great importance in that it still hinders them to some extent, whether or not they gener generally notice it. So for example, even though they, some, to some extent their interactions with the Trinidadians were still limited because they weren't able to speak English. So although yes, she considered, one of the immigrants considered the landlord as family, to what extent, I. I I do not know like to what extent, what she means exactly by family is this, what does family mean exactly to her, like to how close is, how close is their relationship? Is it that he just helps at some times or is it that she has continuous interactions with them or even, even one of them who are unable to, unable to speak the language she communicated with them by a translator, a, an online translator, or with the help of a, or with the help of a friend, but her friendships and relationships were still limited, limited because she did not have the ability to speak English. Also, also, I still think that language is important in terms of getting a job, because what I would say is that, as many of us would know, it, it is a common thing where. A lot of persons right now are currently looking for trying to be employed despite of their despite of their educational status, although they have degrees and all these things, they are still getting they are still unable to obtain the job that they desire. So I think sorry, I I looked at okay, it. I still okay. think that okay. it's Thank important. Thank you very much, Jewel. And, and I think that also has to do with, um, oh, um, what I was mentioning at the beginning, um, using the, in the, the families. Do you feel that these people who have had families here in Trinidad, they try to use their native language with their kids or um, did they mention anything about that during the research? 
sorry, can you repeat? Are you referring to the Spanish immigrants? The Spanish immigrants, uh, at some point, did you find if they are using the Spanish language with their children or if they prefer that their children speak English? The ones that have had children here in Trinidad. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll start with one of them. One of them, they have a, a son and she, yeah, she speaks Spanish with a son and she thinks that it is important as in general, the ability to speak two languages would give persons better opportunities. And so she wants him to met, to continue learning and practicing the language. She did state that sometimes when she speaks to him in Spanish, he does not understand. So he does not understand. So there is, she, oh my gosh, sorry, I, there is, there is the importance there. She does see the need to do so. And there is an, another one of the immigrants. They also had, they also have children and they speak to them in Spanish. Okay, two of them, they speak to them in Spanish as that is what they do not know English and that is what their children understand. Okay, okay thank you. So we have two more questions. Um, to take um, Dr. Ruth Brathwaite's question and then um, one from Fahima Ali. So Dr. Brathwaite as, is asking, do you get any impression of what the attitudes were to different varieties of English, English and Creole in Trinidad? No, no one, they didn't say this out in particular because when asking about English, they, they just basically said that it would have been important to their stay in Trinidad, but I can't say how they felt about the varieties. Okay, okay, and our last question, this one is from Fahima Ali, it's a comment and a question. She says, a wonderful presentation, uh, Jewel. Do you see your research as a stepping stone into a bigger project? What? would you what would you want to focus on next thank you something that i found very interesting that came out of the research was an idea of what is meant by survival meaning to say that i asked the question while while, do, while reading the existing literature i asked the a comment that was made by one of the participants with that the language is necessary for survival however this was not what i found to me it was interesting that of the interviewees the two two of them that were able to speak english and spanish fluently they said that the ability to speak english is necessary to survival while while the ability while those that did not have the ability to speak english so that it was not necessary to survival and this was despite the fact that one of them that had the ability to speak both language, they came to Trinidad without knowing any language because they learned, they, they learned English based on hearing and by having conversations geared towards a specific topic. So I think that uh, that is something I would like to look into because this, depending on how important they perceive the English language to be, maybe the extent to which they desire or push themselves forward to learn this language. So it is something that I'm interested in. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much to our uh, attendees for your questions and your comments. Um, right now it's 11.34. Uh, we are going to have a a short break of 10 minutes and we will resume at 11.45. So please don't go too far. And next, um, after the break, we will have um, two more presentations. One about, um, sorry, uh, one about um, the attitudes from Trinidadians towards Venezuelan immigrants and the next one, uh, an experience of teaching English um, to asylum seekers. So I will see you in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, we are back and uh, it's time for our third presentation of the day. Our presenter is Sapphire Sukram. She is a final year student currently pursuing a BA in French and Spanish. She was born and raised in South Trinidad and she describes herself as passionate about language, culture and traveling someone who tries to strive for excellence and values holistic education. Sapphire was a recipient of a National Additional Language Scholarship in 2017, and she recently returned from France after being an English, an English language assistant over there. Um, today, um, Sapphire's presentation um, has to do with um, um, the attitudes from Trinidadians towards Venezuelan immigrants, migrants. Uh, so, Sapphire, welcome. Thank you so much, Paula, for introducing me, and thank you so much to the DMLL for allowing me to present at the Research Week 2021. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so today, as Paula mentioned, I will be presenting on um, the attitudes of Trinbagonians towards Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad and Tobago over the last three years. So firstly, I want to talk about um, the thoughts that went through my head in formulating the actual research title. So um, firstly, I chose attitudes because um, I wanted to really highlight you know, these negative perceptions and stereotypes that exist and how, how it affects the general treatment of the migrants, the concerns that citizens of Trinidad and Tobago may have concerning the migrants, as well as the various other factors related to the attitudes. Um, initially, I was, doing, I was doing this study on Trinidadians, but then um, after you know, diving more into the research, I realized that I have participants from not just Trinidad, but also Tobago. And oftentimes when doing a study, um, we tend to kind of forget about the other island, the smaller island, Tobago. And so I wanted to um, adopt a more inclusive approach. And so that's the reason why I chose, I changed it to Trinbagonians. Um, in terms of the year period, I chose this specific year period, 2018 to 2021, because one, I was focused on currency. So the fact that um, the Venezuelan migration is something very current. And um, I also wanted to include the details of the pandemic and you know, the effects of COVID-19 and how um, the Venezuela, what, what role do the Venezuelan migrants play in this, um, in this situation. I also wanted to go as far back as 2018 because I did want to include that period of registration that the, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago actually decided to open up for some of the refugees to be able to register, to work and to live legally in Trinidad and Tobago. And this number was estimated around 40,000 migrants who were registered. Um, okay, so I, I also chose Venezuelans and not another um, group of migrants. For example, I could have chosen Chinese, Cubans, Colombians, because being such a multicultural society in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a lot of migrants coming from, you know, all over the world, all over, you know, it's such a diverse population. And so given um, its proximity and the fact that um, Venezuela has is not new. It's not new to have these relations with Venezuela as a country. So I thought that it was most pertinent and most current. Again, currency was a major deciding factor. Um, other motives for the reasons, the other motives for the for the choice of research title was the ever present negative stereotyping of Venezuelans. Um, so there are many. Everybody knows there are many stereotypes that exist. When it comes to the Venezuelan migrants, we always have the, um, the preconceived um, 
I would quote it as mis misperceptions, or sometimes, you know, sometimes it can be proven to be true. But um, for example, the prostitution involving Venezuelan um, migrant women, or even the um, drugs and gangs related to um, this mig migratory group. Um, I also um, was influenced a lot by the presence in the media, as in the, the Venezuelan immigration and its presence in the media. You know, it's constantly in our newspaper articles, in our, on the radio, on the television. It's literally, of, in recent times, a lot of what we hear on the news is based on, um, you know, the Venezuelan migration. So that was another reason for my choice. Again, proximity. Um, another motive was first-hand observation. So in actually um, interacting with some of the migrants that I have come across, you know, you, you hear some of their views and most oftentimes they're really afraid to speak, um, afraid to speak to the citizens, if they, especially if they don't know English. Um, and, and that's the majority of cases where, you know, the migrants really don't speak English. They just know it by hearing it and they start they start off by you know um, learning certain words but in terms of being fluent in the lang language that's a real limitation and that kind of um, induces fear um, additionally i was a bit shocked and surprised um, to know that trinidad and tobago really we really don't have um, a lot of or any uh, migration policies with regard to migrants and refugees. So there are no um, protection rights, then there's, it's generally a violation of human rights because um, a lot of people have, a lot of um, articles that I would have read, people were stating that, you know, um, for example, children don't have, ch migrant children, they don't have access to the public education system in Trinidad and Tobago among other violations of rights. So those were my main reasons for the choice of title. Um, so in terms of my actual study, so I did this case study over the last, um, over the course of the last academic year. And the main objectives of this study was to not only outline the attitudes towards Venezuelan migrants, but also examine them and look at the impact or how it affects you know, treatment, as I mentioned before, treatment, concerns, etc. cetera. Um, so my research questions um, were narrowed by these four questions here. So the positive perceptions of Trinidadians towards Venezuelan migrants, perceptions or attitudes, uh, the negative perceptions or attitudes towards Trinidadians, the general concerns of Trinidadians towards the Venezuelan migrants, and how is the treatment of the Venezuelan migrants based on these attitudes that were highlighted. So um, in terms of the methods used, I would have used a mix of qualitative and quantitative data. I collected my data via uh, questionnaires that were distributed by Google Forms because given the pandemic, it was not a possibility to physically hand out questionnaires. And so, um, I thought that this would be an appropriate way to distribute my questionnaires. Um, they were mainly, they, in the questionnaire, there was basically um, a lot of open-ended questions. Um, of course, demograph de demographic data as well, but a lot of open-ended questions that required opinion-based responses. And so in um, dealing with all of this data, I the data was analyzed by thematic coding. So I separated it into themes to kind of um, narrow down and to kind of synthesize the information that was collected. Uh, in terms of the quantitative data that was collected, this, the analysis was done by quantifying coded data and using numerical analysis. Um, so in terms of the responses, um, I received a total of 123 responses and um, it was a lot of it was opinion based so it was really difficult to kind of sift through and find um, not just the most pertinent ones but they with a questionnaire you know you always risk people um, just saying for example no opinion or you know those things I had to kind of kind of sift through and find the ones that were most pertinent and 
the ones that really explored the attitudes. Um, so the majority of the participants were female, 92 of them were female, and 31, 31 of them were male. I don't know if this had an impact on the kind of responses that I would have gotten. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, in terms of the age bracket, I did not limit the study to any demographic factor, gender, age, anything like that. Um, so I really wanted to ensure that um, the information was varied. It was um, um, relevant and, you know, it really um, dealt with people of different ages because this is an issue, the Venezuelan migration is an issue that affects everyone in Trinidad and Tobago whether negatively or positively, young and old. So I really did not want to have any limitations where that was concerned. So the age bracket was between the ages of 16 and 65 years. Okay, in terms of getting into the meat of things, um, I separated the research into sections where I wanted to first highlight reasons why they come to Trinidad and Tobago, why, why, why Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the attitudes, of course, which is the main point of my case study. So the attitudes I would have broken down into negative and positive, and then male and female. Um, the concerns, so concerns, again, based on the attitudes, what were the Trinidadian citizens thinking, the Trinbagonian citizens thinking, you know, what are they concerned about? What are their um, worries concerning the Venezuelan migration? And lastly, the treatment, how the attitudes affect how um, the citizens treat the migrants on a daily basis. Okay, so the reasons um, mainly indicated um, that obviously to have a better life, they um, wanted to change things for their families, um, to generally improve their quality of life. Um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that Venezuela, there's a lot of social and, un and political unrest going on in Venezuela right now. So that was a reason people are actually fleeing the country to um, find like a safe haven. And um, another reason was to ob obtain job opportunities. So um, given the economic state, of Venezuela, a lot of them lost their jobs or a lot of them have no jobs. And so they come to Trinidad to try to, again, better their lives. Um, in terms of the attitudes, so the this was the main part of my study. Um, the attitudes ranged from positive, negative and neutral. So a lot of them were flat out positive, a lot of them were flat out negative, and then some um, neutral where people you know indicated that they have not had enough interaction with the, the migrants to be able to give an appropriate response so the attitudes firstly i want to highlight the male the attitudes towards the male migrants um, they were significantly more positive meaning that um, a lot a lot more people um, explored attitudes such as um, them being hard working family oriented. Um, a lot of them are just really trying to make ends meet. They're trying to survive. A lot of them are good natured. Um, you know, people talked about them being very respectful, hardworking, whereas the negative attitudes revealed some, and this was the minority, a lot of people said, you know, um, they might be unpleasant or aggressive. Even some would have said uh, they lack work ethic. Some obviously said, you know, um, they contribute to the rise in criminal activity in a country like Trinidad, where crime is already rampant. You know, they, they, a lot of citizens are of the opinion that um, the level of criminal activity has indeed increased. Um, and lastly, they are vulnerable to exploitation. In terms of the attitudes towards female migrants, this was, um, the attitudes were more shared. So it was not more positive or more negative. And obviously there were neutral attitudes where people, again, did not um, have much of an opinion in terms of whether they think it's negative or positive. So the um, positive attitudes included, again, they are hardworking, trying to survive, trying to make ends meet, 
a lot of people talked about them being attractive. Um, the responses were really interesting. A lot of people talked about, you know, this, um, the image we have of the Venezuelan woman, you know, with the curves and everything. So a lot of people, the responses were very, very interesting. Um, they also indicated that they're good natured and family oriented. However, on the, uh, on the downside, people indicated that they're vulnerable to exploitation. They are immoral. So a lot of people talk about the way that they dress and the way that they dress, sorry. And um, the way that it's kind of pr provocative how they dress. Uh, a lot of people address those um, attitudes. Um, people also spoke about them being discriminated against, sexually objectified, um, given this common um, stereotype that all Venezuelan women are prostitutes. Um, people also spoke of them being unpleasant. One person actually said, you know, um, the Venezuelan women speak too loud in the taxis. It was really interesting to see some of the um, comments of the participants. And lastly, people spoke about them being ill-mannered. Okay, in terms of the concerns of the citizens of Trinidadians, um, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, in response to the influx of migrants, um, they were mainly, the, the concerns were mainly negative. Um, they spoke about the economic strain and the lack of resources. So a lot of them spoke about, you know, they said, for example, how am I not getting a job and the Venezuelans are getting a job um, our current economic situation, you know, with the pandemic, especially, how is it that I'm home and the Venezuelans are out there working? You know, a lot of people had concerns about this, even the lack of resources. They spoke about, um, like, we need to benefit from our education, health system, ed education and health systems, for example. Why should the Venezuelans have access to our resources, the resources that are made for the citizens of our country? You know, a lot of these were the concerns that came about. Um, another major concern, given the time period, obviously, that I explored, was the ongoing pandemic. Um, so the spread of COVID-19. A lot of people were of the opinion that it is indeed the Venezuelans. Uh, well, a, for a large, a large part of uh, the reason is that the Venezuelans are coming in e illegally and we have no means of tracking them and really seeing, you know, um, if we need to do COVID tests, etc. So these people are really just mingling in the population. And so that was a major concern, the spread of illnesses. Um, in terms of um, the concern of the violation of human, human rights, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, for example, the children, Venezuelan children, don't have access to the um, public education system. Now, there are a lot of NGOs and faith-based organizations who would have um, started, you know, different programs to teach the children English or to really try to get them to um, have this right that we should all have of education. Um, and then again, another concern, um, the rise in criminal activity. So as I mentioned before, you know, a lot of um, things to do with prostitution, uh, gangs, um, guns and ammunition. A lot of people explain that this is a serious concern and we don't know what they're coming with. We don't know, um, you know, we really don't know what, what they're coming with. We don't know what their intentions are. And so, yes, that was another concern. Um, in terms of the treatment, um, it is indeed evident that attitudes do affect the treatment because um, a lot of them are exploited. So a lot of them are overworked, underpaid, they work um, hours that aren't billable, they, um, they have to pay, for example, exorbitant rents because landlords look at it as an opportunity to really make a lot of money. And, you know, a lot of them are really being exploited, you know, based on these attitudes that exist. A lot of them, again, are discriminated against. People have, um, citizens are uh, expressing, you know, xenophobic attitudes or racial prejudice. A lot of them are saying, you know, um, we need to preserve our culture and they're gonna come and change everything. Um, and, you know, the whole term calling them venies is kind of not derogatory, but it's not, it's, it, 
they don't look at it in a in a good light um additionally the language barrier so a lot of people are kind of ill treating them because they can't speak english so they think okay if i shout they would understand what i'm saying or if i verbally abuse them they will understand my point they will get my point you know a lot of people are not very accommodating and um understanding that you know they have left venezuela with literally the clothes on their backs and they can't speak the language you know it's it's all a matter it's it's all about the matter of integration um additionally there is the objectification of women i read a lot of articles for example this one woman spoke about um her landlord coming in a venezuelan woman um her landlord coming in at night in her apartment and asking for sexual favors and all of these things are things that come up just because of the the general stereotype that um the venezuelan women are prostitutes and they have no choice but to um be prostitutes to make money and to make ends meet and a lot of them are saying that they really they really hope that especially trinidadian women would value um value their womanhood and um accept the possibility that you know some of them are coming here very qualified and have no choice but to accept you know low paying jobs and deal with this objectification and discrimination um additionally there was the general abuse and violence towards the, the migrants so a lot of um articles and sources that i would have consulted spoke about police violence like viol um police for example the ill treatment as well taking their um their their cards their immigration cards you know trying to um um just generally abusing them in the streets and um also the immigration officials um when they come in you know they they always talk about the um abuse and violence that they use as a means to um kind of um deal with the migrants okay so in terms of um my limitations i uh, again given the pandemic questionnaires was um questionnaires were the most um most appropriate um means of collecting the data it was distributed by google forms and a huge limitation was probably that not everyone had access to you know a means of um doing the actual questionnaire and um so that was a limitation as well um as opposed to you know physically going out and handing out um questionnaires to be filled regarding the literature review it was very difficult to find attitudes negative attitudes towards male migrants because a lot of the sources explored um the negative attitudes towards the female because the females because it's mainly the females who experience um the negative the negative treatment so that was another limitation as well um in terms of the recommendations i um for the study i would like to do more on the economic factors um so for example you know a lot of people spoke about the competition in the labor market so i would like to do more research on that and um the non economic factors as well such as racial prejudice etc um additionally i think that future research can be carried out on a larger scale um with 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 more reference to the caribbean territory because a lot of the studies that i would have consulted and reviewed they were based on international migration and you know in europe or in different continents and so um given that it's it's immigration is not new it's not a new concept it's not a new issue um i think that you know a lot more studies and a lot more research can be done on um these this partic this particular topic um of venezuelan migration and migration in general um so that is it thank you so much for your attention everybody thank you very much safair um actually this topic i think is one of those topics that generates 
generate those morning discussions. Um, um, there were um, different, that, different aspects that you mentioned regarding um, stereotyping and attitudes from people towards Spanish, Venezuelans. And uh, sadly, I have to mention that it's not necessarily only towards Venezuelans, but mm -hmm. it, it has broadened to any person who speaks Spanish. Yeah. And I have been able to, to experience similar uh, situations. Mm -hmm. However, um, I believe that um, the, what, what you just did is, is a first step. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the main purpose of doing research is finding, um, voicing a problem and trying to find solutions for that problem. Even if you don't find the solutions directly yourself, mm -hmm. at least you put it out there and then it generates more research and more action. Yeah. So that's, um, I thank you for that. And also for bringing it to this space, because um, uh, most of those um, experiences that you mentioned, you heard them from people on the street. Mm -hmm. You don't hear those things in, in a space, in academic space like this. Exactly, one. yeah. So a lot I of it was first-hand observation. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think is um, your project is, is timely, it's very important, and we are very grateful that you decided to present it. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, we have um, quite a couple of questions here, so I'm going to read some of them as uh, so we don't stand too much. Um, this one is from Dr. Bradway. He says, um, a great presentations of fire. Did anyone express any language attitudes? Um, one of our linguistic students, Christiana Degay, last year, looked at a similar topic from the point of view of Venezuelan immigrants. And some of them said they were afraid to speak Spanish in public. Um, did any of the persons that you interview display any negative or positive attitudes towards the language itself? As I mentioned, I think, before, not only Venezuelans, but Spanish speakers? The, the, the Latin American community in general. Um, yes, um, a lot of people spoke about, you know, the language barrier and it being a huge limitation because a lot of them, a lot of the migrants are fearful to actually um, socialize, um, to meet new people, to, um, to get jobs, to look for jobs, even to, um, in their living spaces, a lot of them, you know, opt to live with other migrants so that speaking um, one common language is not an issue because a lot of them, a, 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 the majority of them cannot speak English to actually have a conversation with someone. So um, that was a really interesting thing to highlight the language barrier being a huge issue for them. Okay. Um, and I think that also links uh, with um, the findings from Jewel, the, pre the previous presentation. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily admitted to be an issue sometimes, but it's clearly one of them. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Dr. Nicole Roberts. I lost it. Okay. Um, she says, a great project and presentation, Sapphire. My question is, did any Trinidadians express comments on the migrant children? For example, the lack of access to schooling in Trinidad. Um, yes, very few, but there were responses um, regarding the education of migrant children. A lot of people um, don't realize that the when they come here, the Venezuelan children, they actually can't be put into a school there are no policies, we have no policies on, or, or laws on these human rights, the, the human rights of education, for example. So a lot of, um, or some of the participants indicated that, you know, the country, the government needs to do, needs to make a greater effort to kind of include the children in the school system, because really and truly, um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that they, they are coming, they are entering the country, you know, and we don't want to rob them of that right to actually access um, 
the education. And like I mentioned before, there were there are there are NGOs and faith-based organizations, for example, the Living Water Community, that have implemented certain programs, but it's just not enough because um, they actually need to be integrated and have that opportunity to um, access the public health, the public education system, sorry. Okay. Um, there is a question here from Abriana Matthew related to that. She says, um, do you think that if Venezuelan migrant children were allowed to join our primary and secondary schools, this would help with tolerance and potentially lead to more positive attitudes towards migrants? Um, yes, I do, because um, this was just an observation. Uh, this was not confirmed in the study, but a lot of the elderly people are the ones that are really opposed to the Venezuelan migration. The children are more accepting and they don't view it as an issue. And so when the, the Venezuelan migrant children actually integrate into the school system, I do think that that will kind of create a space that can generate, you know, positive attitudes towards them from a young age, you know? Okay, um, and now there is another comment, but this one is regarding um, stereotyping and attitudes towards discrimi discrimination towards um, the migrants. Mm -hmm. um, um, Jake um, Solom, so Acts, it will comments. Um, do you think that Trinidad general treatment of women directly influences the treatment of Venezuelan women? I think it's interesting to note how Venezuelan women receive more discrimination in the context of Trinidad because if you look at conversations of migration and the refugee crisis in the US and Europe, the men receive a lot of discrimination because right-wing media associates men with rising crime rates. I think the problem in Trinidad and Tobago is this stereotype of prostitution. For example, in terms of the woman, and this is actually really unfortunate that it's really the women that have the most to say about the other Venezuelan women, the Trinidadian women who actually have the most negative opinions about, you know, um, Venezuelan woman and so a lot of them were talking about um, things like or oh, they're here to steal my husband or um, they look at how they're dressing or uh, even one of the comments said that my husband is constantly in the bar I know it's um, I know that um, he has a prostitute you know so like those things came up and it is these comments did come from you know female participants so I do think that is um, really interesting to note that um, you know, it's actually the woman bringing down the woman, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the discussion about that is quite wide. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, some other uh, comments. I am just going to pick up one more and we can continue the conversation in the chat so we don't steal time from the next presenter. Mm -hmm. So the, the last um, comment is, from Michael Roberts, he says, migrants and refugees are not one and the same. One is protected by the UN convention and the other isn't. Should we be, should we be making this distinction? And if so, what does it mean for Trinidad and Tobago? So in the in the lead review that you did, Sapphire, do you find mm -hmm. a, this distinction and do you think for the context of Trinidad and Tobago, it is important to continue doing this, this distinction and if that somehow will influence the attitudes that you are talking about? Um, so for this study, for the purposes of the study, I did focus mainly on the migrants because I wanted to talk about, you know, um, not just legal immigration, but illegal immigration. Um, and so I, because of the lack of policies um, for the refugees, I did not um, have a huge focus on the, um, the matter of the refugees, but I do think that this, this, this distinction should be made because um, they're very different as, um, as you know, um, he mentioned. 
So yes, I do think it's important to make this distinction. Okay, so thank you very much, Sophia. Thank uh, you. you. have created a great discussion. You mm -hmm. will comment in the chat. So I would I invite you to interact with the with the attendees and maybe respond some of these questions. Okay. Next presenter, our our next presenter is Mr. Romulo Guedes Fernandez. He is an instructor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics. And Mr. Fernandez, uh, Guedes Fernandez has also been involved recently with um, programs that focus on teaching English to um, migrants and asylum seekers, um, as well as um, well, different programs um, regarding uh, teaching English as a foreign language, um, and these programs uh, organized by the international organizations that are dealing with this. Uh, so welcome, um, Romulo. Thank you very much, Paola, for the presentation. Uh, before I start, I would like to just give a brief history of the DMLL, the involvement of the DMLL in these programs dealing with refugees. In 2017, we, in the DISOL program, we have a teaching practicum and we had about 50 or 60 refugees who took part in the ESL classes later on in 2018 and again in 2019. Uh, and then in late in 2019, we created or developed a workshop to teach ESL and to train a small ESL teacher training workshop that was delivered to a group of 12 trainees. And here, Ms. Siobhan Dubari from Living Water Community was instrumental and she asked the DMLL for this type of program. Let then Dr. Roberts um, and Dr. Heather Keto as Dean of the Department were very instrumental in um, uh, supporting this program and helping to develop this. Later on, uh, this program has, they have continued and Professor Elizabeth Wolko Hasho as head of the department also has been very instrumental in the implementation of these ESL projects. In 2020, um, uh, this is um, recent in this last year and in the 2019, the team of trainers um, included Dr. Ibrahim Ali and Ms. Natalie Bagwani from the Center for Language Learning. And we developed a series of workshops and teaching practicum or teaching practice exercises to train um, Trinidadians and Venezuelan migrants to teach English to uh, migrants with a low level of proficiency in English or no English. So the support was from, had the support, a uh, part of the UE Open Hand Initiative led by Ms. Krista Sarkansin as a project manager and in partnership with the Pan American Development Foundation. So Ms. Camila Murray, deputy director and Hannah Kagwaru, program manager, were instrumental in help in these programs, in shaping and helping us to work on this program. And also I would like to acknowledge the participation of the trainees that we had in 12 in took part from Living Water Community, nine was the, were the trainees who took part in the first teaching training a workshop, 10 later on, 10 Venezuelans, and later on, 10 more. And also we had a group of volunteer ESL teachers who were from the Department of Modern Language and Linguistics, TISOL graduates that did the diploma in TISOL or the masters in TISOL. So they also took part as a volunteer ESL teachers. So the beginning of this workshop in 2020 was face-to-face -face, and then we have to move quickly to the online platform because of the COVID of the pandemic. So I also would like to thank all this um, number of migrants who took part in this were part of the ESL classes the way um, I will explain later on part of this service learning project to train teachers and also to um, help them in their learning of English. So I will share with, so my presentation today is about this, it's more about the action research that was done 
um, in this um, in these workshops and teaching practical exercises. So the title is online English language teaching, even though we started with the face uh, face to face, but we have to move quickly to that online. I will go a little bit on the over uh, background, the aim, rationale, content, then of the project, the Open Hand Initiative, then a little bit on history and also a little bit of language, a, a part of background on language teaching and learning and also on service learning, the structure of the program, the implementation, and then the challenges and lessons learned in the in this program. So the, as I said before, was in partnership with the UPADF, Pan American Development Foundation, is an actual research project supporting Venezuelan migrants in the Caribbean. This is the initial. Initially, we had here um, a photo, but we had to move quickly to a Zoom as it, it became very familiar to us that uh, uh, window with the, the, U, the Zoom. So the aim of the workshop was to improve education of um, uh, teachers and uh, in teaching second language, English as a second language to migrants with very low level of proficiency. And the idea was to help them, the trainees, um, to uh, be trained and to be able to effectively teach English as a second language. The rational humanitarian reasons, we learned about many programs that have been organized in Trinidad and Tobago but they need a lot of more support in terms of training teachers how to teach English to second language learners. And not only just the idea that because you are a you speak English, you can teach English to anyone. So they needed a little bit more of training. And I think that was one of the ideas behind this, that we move us to do some, uh, develop these workshops and support the migrants. Also, uh, opportunities and for uh, develop this type of programs that are very needed in the Caribbean. So one of the things uh, when we go to teaching methods, and this quotation is from 1956, language is not a sterile subject to be confined to the classroom. So one of the two things, one or two things must be done. Either life must be brought to the classroom or the class must be taken to the life, making language relevant to the learner's situation. A crash in 1977. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, um, you were frozen for a little bit and um, we didn't hear this part and for a few seconds. If you can just re um, recap on the last it, things that this you one. after this one. Oh, sorry. Yes, baby, it's my internet connection. Yes, probably. Yeah. Um, so the teaching methods in, in language teaching, in training are important. And I will look at this a little bit later. But in 1956, Trevans uh, quoted this, this, language is not a sterile subject to be confined to the classroom. One, one or two things must be done. Either life must be brought to the classroom or the class must be taken to life. So this is actualized and is still valid in the present when we talk about communicative language teaching. When we make language, what we teach relevant to our learners needs, context, situation. And in the case that we will talk about just now about migrants is very um, crucial. This important uh, bringing um, uh, the life to the, to the classroom. Krashen in 1977, he suggested that people acquire language uh, once one the person is exposed to comprehensible input. This means that when we are learning a language, we need the support. Um, that is, for instance, if you are teaching, you may need to, especially when you teach migrants or people who do not know the language, or you don't know their first language, you may use different techniques and procedures or methods to teach them. And one of the ideas behind this is make the input comprehensible. For instance, if you teach vocab, you may show the picture, you may show the word in their first and the second language and in their first language. So language, the first language may be also used as a tool to teach um, first uh, uh, language learners once it is 
in a context, I will say that is a monolingual learners. So Crash also claimed that linguistic competence, um, which is learning about language, about the rules of language, about knowledge of the language, but also uh, how to use the language, performing in the language. So it's, it's, um, it's being acquired and help us to produce to be fluent in the language. But also, um, he may he also agree that conscious learning sometimes may not be used as a source of spontaneous language production. For instance, some people may know a lot of grammar, but they may not be able to produce um, in the second language. In teaching language, there are different dimensions. For instance, when we talk about, and this is one of the guiding when we help us to design these uh, ESL teacher training workshops, for instance, when we teach the language and um, the nature of language, uh, when we talk about that, we talk, um, we refer to um, the, how language is being taught, what is language itself. So, and then um, more or less, we talk about the form and the function, grammar and meaning, or that's one, uh, one way of using to, to make, to, to teach the language. There are like two, I would say extremes of focus on the form, on grammar, on linguistic rules, or on meaning, or on function. The nature of second language learning also deals how you teach. You want to teach them to be analytic, to analyze the language, or you want them by experience, by using the language in a real life context. So experiential learning, for instance. In terms of the goals and objectives of teaching, we can talk about accuracy or communication. You want them to be accurate, you want them to be fluent, you want them to communicate, or you want them to be precise, but no with a lack of fluency. The different type of syllabus also are key in designing teacher training programs. For instance, you can use um, create syllabus that are based on the system, lang let's say grammar, phonology, um, vocabulary, uh, discourse, or you will like them, the, 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 the syllabus to be based on skills, lesson, reading, writing, etc. Or sometimes we can talk about segregated, separate, or integrated, the skills and the language system, which is grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. And the role of the teacher, learners, and instructional materials are key. The role of teacher or the teacher is to be a guide to facilitate learning. But learners and the learners role is also to engage in the language activity in the in their learning. So the uh, has been seen in over the years that um, a role of a teacher is cognitive, just promote knowledge, but not um, be aware of the needs and concerns of the students. Or sometimes it's seen as a, the person that is transfer information, but not that dialogic uh, conversation or interaction with the students. And the different types of activities and techniques and procedures that can be used in the classroom can be seen. You can teach in a way that is deductive. It means you give the rule or inductive, they discover the rule and that may lead to acquisition. Or you may use bilingual techniques or monolingual techniques in the classroom. So the teaching methodologies can be study in when we are being trained as a teachers, but can be, we cannot see them as prescriptions, a how to teach, um, but seeing them as a source of well-used practice as Richard and Rogers recommend. And you will see how this is a um, key in teaching when we teach migrants, because we have to adapt what we teach to their um, uh, context uh, and needs, as he says. In these programs, we um, in the ESL workshops, we design at ESL teaching practicum to teach migrants. So that follow um, framework of community engagement pedagogies, which incorporates community service. So it's a mutual benefit between the community and the, uh, I would say teacher or learners. Service learning entails that kind of collaboration, faculty and community partners. And then as it's done, for instance, in medicine, they practice or is, um, practice learning, but also promotes learning and at the same time address human and community needs. And this is one of the ideas that, that move us to do this, to, to design this ESL teaching practicum and to get migrants to participate in this. 
and because of the COVID, uh, the pandemic, the implementation has been a little bit was a little bit challenged, but um, we include we were able to cope with many of these challenges. Um, in teaching ESL teacher training uh, for this particular program, we focus on integrating knowledge and application of key basic concepts and principles of language learning, teaching, and classroom assessment when we train teachers, when we train the teachers to teach. But also, we cover all the, the, the language system, as is said there. The structure of the program follow this. The first thing was about the key concepts about learning and teaching, second language learning, second language teaching, and even language learning theories and second language learning theories, and the common urban framework of reference as a standard in language learning, teaching, and assessment. We also, um, as a part of the history of language teaching, we um, use those language teaching methodologies that have been used throughout the years in order to inform learners or our trainees the different methodologies and then the language systems grammar vocab pronunciation and skills lesson in reading writing speaking the syllabus design was a key part in this because the syllabus has to be designed based on learners needs and we conducted a needs analysis in able to enable to be able to produce this syllabus and the syllabus was negotiated between trainees and learners. The lesson planning and selecting adaptive materials took a lot of time and um, proved to be one of the challenges areas for trainees, how to design, prepare a lesson plan, adapt material, etc. And we, the trainers, in, engaged in observing their classes, providing constructive and positive feedback to, to, to trainees. So the ESL practicum was a um, service learning program to support migrants, and at the same time, we want to, to um, uh, train these ESL teachers to develop practical use of, uh, of the, the skills they have learned, but also to um, apply theory into practice and develop their teaching skills. Um, and the practical consideration that we had before beginning this teaching practicum was that the classes should be um, for first in the ESL teacher training be, between 10 to 12 trainees. And then the idea was also to improve teachers' innovative ESL skills in lesson planning and teaching practice, and to help them to understand a little bit and to put into practice second language acquisition and second language teaching and learning and the different methodologies. And that contributes to their on the professional development. These are the participants' trainees. In the first one, we have nine. That is from the 7th of March to the 26th of April, uh, six male females. And then in the teaching practicum, we have out of these nine, seven. And then we have five female volunteers, teachers, ESL teachers who were part of the, who did the TESOL in U with the postgrad diploma in TESOL. And then in the second ESL teacher training workshop, we integrated the ESL and the practicum. And we have 10 trainees, and these ones were Venezuelans. This is a picture of participants. And this is the group of migrants who took part. So we have migrants from Trinidad and Tobago and from Guyana and from different nationalities, mainly female 82 in total and 18. So this, the age range was between 18 and 64 years old. The majority of them were um, 65, 61.9 have pursued a university degree and 22.9 completed the secondary school and 15.3% possessed technical qualification and 10.2 were unemployed. In the second, um, July, August, we had at about, about 57 um, migrants, in total um, 40 female and 17 males, and more or less the same distribution of learners. Uh, the total learners who took part in the two teaching practicums were 175 out of them, uh, 122 female and 53 males. Um, and um, more or less the classes were online in small groups and the teachers were um, getting them engaged in the, in, the, in the class. So we did the needs analysis, a syllabus design, 
we did the, with them uh, workshops and meetings to prepare lesson plans, and also we did the classroom observation. I will go little by this. But the learners' profiles, in general, learners um, no means no lessening. They were not able to lessen well. Um, this one is very limited, and the next one is limited and basic. We focus on this workshop with low proficiency learners. So we allow them the very low levels, no English or very little English to be part of this workshop. So in general, they prefer, um, they, they needed lesson speaking. This is the order of the things, of the skills they wanted. So you see that grammar, um, knowledge of grammar was also very, very low. And vocab and all of them, so the blue and red shows a little bit that. What they wanted, they wanted learn more about speaking, pronunciation, listening, vocab, and the last thing they wanted to learn was grammar. And then the accents, this is a very important part because they, we asked them different questions about different accents. And the first one was American English, the second Trinidad and English, and then British, Canadian, and we put a few more, but no comments. The syllabus follow this, um, I would say, framework um, in terms of integrating all the skills, pronunciation, listening, vocal, the functional language, the grammar, and the topic that was center, and also the task that was really related to their real life situations. This is for a low, low level, and this is an example for a higher level. For instance, here, the topic was health and illness. And then we use a rubric to assess or to provide feedback to our trainees. This is the classroom observation form based on instructional delivery and also the, um, how they manage the classroom, different comments. This was done and shared with the trainees. All of the trainers, we did at least three observations with each of the trainees and they, we provided feedback. At the end of the workshop, we, had the, we gave them a certificate of participation. So we had that program in 19, 29th, and sorry, 19th, September 20th. And um, a, a number of trainees uh, and trainers and also ESL migrants participated. Challenges we had. In this workshop, um, one of the main challenges we had was the COVID situation that we have to deal with and at the same time move all the material we had done already designed to be taught face to face to be taught online. Then the use of different platform because we will start proving, uh, testing and we realized that the Google Classroom was not the best platform to use with the migrants because of their poor devices the, or the um, internet connection. And also um, we uh, moved to WhatsApp messages and to provide them homework and feedback to learners. And we, create, we created WhatsApp groups for every class and the, and the teachers were interacting with them and providing those written or, um, uh, or, or lessening uh, materials. And then uh, we also had some problems with blackouts and a lot of unstable and stable internet connectivity. Um, and later on, when the economy began to open again, trainees, I mean, ESL learners stopped coming because they were they went back to work. So the number reduced a little bit. So more challenges that we had was about the experiences that some of the, the trainees experienced challenges relating to how to teach grammar and to relate that to the context of the ESL learners to bring life into the classroom or to make that language that they were teaching learner center or experiencing, get the, the learners to experience the language. And I think this is an important point in terms of justice, because if we look at the CFR or the different teaching methodologies, they may have to be um, bypassed because what, is ma what matters here is um, provide learners with a meaningful language for them to be able to communicate. Uh, also, um, because of that, some of the learners um, were not able, they, they didn't understand explanation of grammar and they stopped coming. And the use of the first language was another problem we had because some of the teachers didn't uh, wanted not to use the first uh, Spanish with a very, very low level of proficiency. It's fine, but they have to provide, we have to provide a lot of support how to teach and to make that input 
comprehensible, what Krashen said at the beginning. And a number of migrants experienced some health conditions or family problems, um, many different things. Like for instance, they didn't have glasses or some problems like cancer. And we managed to contact through the UV Open Hand Initiative also to provide some support to them. And the lessons learned in terms of timetable, we had classes in the morning and the afternoon and at night. So we realized that the best time for them is was in the evening, 7 to 8.30 or 9 p.m. during the week, during weekdays. Sometimes Fridays and Saturdays were not the best days. And also the size of the class, we wanted the classes to be small, small size class. So eight to 10 learners. Um, and the teaching of grammar, as I said before, for the learn for the um, trainer trainees to teach that in an implicit manner or explicit approach and to make meaningful sometimes it got a lot of support they needed a lot of support and they managed to do it and then the english and um, the different varieties because trinidad and tobago is a multilingual in a multilingual situation so they are exposed to trinidad english creole so we use the trinidad english creole in the classroom to teach English, standard English, or Caribbean English, or Trinidadian English or in, to them. But um, we were um, helping them with what they use because some of them were able to tell us, but I don't understand what this means. And we were able to teach them and um, use that as another tool, as we said before, first language, but also Trinidadian English Creole was another tool to teach them to understand and to be able to communicate because that was the focus of the workshop. So we follow a team teaching model in which two teachers, two uh, ESL teachers were teaching together the class. And that was very useful. They collaborate and we shared lessons with the whole group of teachers and that helped also all the teachers to develop, to grasp how to teach the different ways, et cetera, of teaching skills. Some of the co uh, trainees comments, I said, I was nervous and, uh, nervous and excited at the same time. This is when that person was about to teach the first class. I felt this way because I would be teaching persons who need English as a survival tool. So a lot of research and preparation went into it. I had never thought a pre year one class, which is a no English at all or very little English, this added to my nervousness. The entire lesson went well because all of the students were very receptive and eager to learn. The only thing that I would deem as unsuccessful is the 40 minutes limit to Zoom because we were using the basic Zoom account. I will focus more on pronunciation because they realized, we realized that learners needed more pronunciation. And one of the volunteers, ESL teachers commented that also, even though this is a person who has been trained before in the program, um, I love, appreciate that experience of being able to offer the, uh, the, the opportunity to teach and assist migrants in Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana because this person was teaching classes from with both. And um, so some trials we had actually in this teaching, but um, internet and other things, especially in Guyana, the connection was, connectivity was immediately the best. Many of them dropped because of that. But many, all of them, all the, many students show resilience as they ensure that they attended the classes. Um, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I am willing to answer them. Thank you very much, Romulo, for your presentation. I think it's very insightful. Um, something that caught my attention uh, of all what you said is when you said, because you speak English, you can't teach English. And I think this is a common misconception of people in general and um, teachers, language teachers, we have to deal with that. Um, comments like, oh, because you speak Spanish, that's why you teach Spanish. And, that, and, and then you just show us um, all the different aspects that are involved in the process of language teaching and language acquisition, the different methodologies, knowledge about um, those um, international standards, how to select materials and all the different things that, that go into the work of planning for a class. 
Um, so let me see if there is anyone who, from the attendees who have any questions regarding your presentation. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask you about using Trinidad and Tobago Creole in the classroom. You mentioned that um, this, mm -hmm. the persons learning English, they weren't very keen on learning grammar. Uh, so what aspects of the Trinidad and Tobago English Creole did you include in the, in the language classes? Um, well, we, we included the listening comprehension. We wanted to use the same English they were listening on the street to be able to understand, comprehend, and then use that to teach standard English and to say, and for them to be able to communicate with the other person using standard English. Because it was a, a challenge, could be a challenge for a learner to learn two languages at the same time. So we focus on teaching English, standard English, and also in helping them, guiding a little bit on understanding the Trinidad and English Creole. So for instance, we had to select some of the more relevant expressions or when they, they encounter in, in the street and use that to teach them. For instance, I'm going and coming, um, uh, et cetera, and different Trinidad expressions. And then, okay, this is what is done or what you said in English. And also the challenges they have, for instance, to use contractions. I am, instead of I'm here, um, in understand, that is another challenge they have because that doesn't happen in Spanish as in English. And it's used in spoken language, not in written language. And also things, uh, different, different areas in terms of vocab that is relevant to their situation. For instance, when we had to teach them about a job interview, a pre-A1, a very, very low level of proficiency learner uh, was not able to, to cope, but we use the linguistic resources and non-linguistic resources or non-verbal communication features for them to be able to communicate even with single phrases or the language they have. That is known in English, in English language teaching, teaching language or you know, teaching methodologies, uh, task-based language teaching. So we wanted to implement that, that also, that approach, because it's more, makes the language more relevant to the context. And we use the language that they needed in order to uh, get them engaged in learning the language, motivated. And because of the needs analysis, we knew the topics they were interested and they needed. We wanted to, we, we asked them about the situations in which they needed English. So we have to, in a certain sense, apply social justice, not to follow the prescribed rules from the CFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, or what's supposed to be taught at the pre-A1 level, but we need to teach them for their survival needs, the language they needed in order to operate, to communicate, or to maybe get a job, or, uh, attend a job interview. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this actually um, is linked to another question from Dr. Roberts. Um, the, the fact that, that you did the, need, the needs analysis and you knew what they were interested in learning, also, we noticed that the, the major interest was in learning the American English accent. So Dr. Roberts question is, do you use any comparative sessions like using American English um, with, with what you were teaching? Like the different accents, were they able to distinguish or you made them aware of those differences while, while teaching. Yes, yes, we made aware of the differences that in American English, but also Trinidadian English, and the differences between the, for instance, the final ER, and, and also the, we didn't, I would say, in terms of the use of the, in, in the pronunciation, or for instance, when you say new or new, or what ter, Canadian or American, or British or Trinidadian. So we expose them to different accents. And also how it's said in Trinidad and Tobago. For instance, sometimes you don't say mouth, mouth, or um, different, that 
were, was used in the classroom. But mainly, many teachers, because at this level, it's very hard to find material to use for lessening comprehension. We have to develop some material to use in the classroom. Maybe recall okay. very short, um, we did that very short, um, I would say, um, uh, passages about a typical situation or provide them text and then read for them and helping them how to go about and they needed to and they were really motivated to learn pronunciation so they, when the class included pronunciation because we wanted to include pronunciation but also get them to practice to use the language so the class wasn't like a traditional um, ESL class we want to teach a, a language that is relevant to them and also get them to practice and provide feedback and correct their pronunciation, etc. So we, we wanted them to use the language. And okay. that was an experience also that we got at the, at the beginning because some of the, the learners were saying um, that they wanted to practice. They wanted to use the language and to be corrected. We learn, all of us learn by mistake, making mistakes. So mm -hmm. we use that also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, we have two more questions. Um, what I'm going to ask um, Abriana Matthew's question first, and then Catherine. Um, Abriana is asking, did you notice any patterns in which English accent the students chose to imitate or what was easier for them to pronounce? Yes. Um... Patterns that were difficult for them to pronounce uh, included, like, for instance, vowels, the difference between uh, different vowels, and also the pronunciation of vowels, and also the uh, teaching uh, voc uh, pronunciation was integrated. There was not a class about pronunciation, was integrated in the language that was used. So the um, different sounds that are not present in Spanish, how they are pronounced in English, that was, um, and, and they were really, um, willing to learn, but also the idea was not just to teach them, yes, teach them, but also give tools for them to do, continue to learn on their own, to develop strategies, to go online, there are many resources online, dictionaries and tools to learn pronunciation. So also that type of resources were shared with them for them to, on their own, uh, continue to learn. Okay. Okay. So one last question uh, from Catherine Mohammed, and I'm going to link this question to the question that we have been asking today. Um, she's asking, did the migrants find it harder to learn Trinidadian Creole than standard English? Then my question would be, did, were you able to sense any type, any attitudes towards those two variations of the language? Yes, so it is harder for them to learn Trinidadian English Creole than standard English. And we sense that attitude because they didn't want to learn, even though they expressed in that needs analysis, they wanted to learn Trinidadian English. Um, they, were, they wanted to be able to understand, but not to use. So they expressed that, attitude, that kind of attitude, yes. They prefer to, to understand, but not to use. And many of them also, had in mind the idea of moving to another country, not to stay in Trinidad. That's another um, attitude we, we sense. And many also wanted to stay in Trinidad. They love Trinidad and they wanted to stay. So there are different, different. we cannot generalize in that sense. So there, there were different attitudes in different learners. So they have some had relatives in the US and that's why they wanted to move to the US. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Romulo. I think this is how we reach the end of this of today's session. I want to thank you for um, um, accepting to present at this event and for your experience, and also to thank all our attendees for staying with us uh, for the whole day. Um, we um, expect to see you tomorrow again. Uh, the presentation tomorrow are mainly um, about um, um, sign language. Um, we have a keynote speaker to close um, our event and tomorrow's session, um, as um, Prof uh, Dr. Brathway mentioned before, um, is Professor um, Hubert Devonish. He is a well-known researcher, academic um, professor. He's um, accompanying us from uh, Jamaica. 
And all the sessions tomorrow will be interpreted in sign language. So we will love to see you tomorrow. Um, it's going to be our, our last day of this um, DMLA MLA, uh, Research Week uh, and Social Justice. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope to see you tomorrow.